Section eleven of A Far Country by Winston Churchill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter ten, part two. Beside the clerk's desk in the Potts house, relating one of his anecdotes, I spied Colonel Varney and managed presently to draw him upstairs to his room. What's the matter? he asked. Do you know a man named Krebs in the house? I said. From Elkington? why that's the man the hutchinsons let slip through the hutchinsons who own the mills over there the agitators put up a job on them the colonel was no longer the genial and social purveyor of anecdotes he had become tense alert suspicious what's he up to he's found out about this bill i replied how i don't know but someone told him that it originated in our office and that we were going to use it in our suit against the Ribblevale. I related the circumstances of my running across Krebs, speaking of having known him at Harvard. Colonel Varney uttered an oath and strode across to the window where he stood looking down into the street from between the lace curtains. "'We'll have to attend to him right off,' he said." I was surprised to find myself resenting the imputation, and deeply. "'I'm afraid he's one of those who can't be attended to,' I answered. "'You mean that he's in the employ of the Ribblevale people?' the colonel inquired. "'I don't mean anything of the kind,' I retorted, with more heat perhaps than I realized. The colonel looked at me queerly. "'That's all right, Mr. Parrott.' of course i don't want to question your judgment sir and you say he's a friend of yours i said i knew him at college but you will pardon me the colonel went on when i tell you that i've had some experience with that breed and i have yet to see one of em you couldn't come to terms with in some way in some way he added significantly i did not pause to reflect that the colonel's attitude from his point of view yes and from mine had i not adopted it was the logical one in that philosophy every man had his price or his weakness yet such is the inconsistency of human nature i was now unable to contemplate this attitude with calmness mr krebs is a lawyer has he accepted a pass from the railroad i demanded knowing the custom of that corporation of conferring this delicate favour on the promising young talent in my profession i reckon he's never had the chance said mr varney well has he taken a pass as a member of the legislature no i remember looking that up when he first came down sent that back if i recall the matter correctly colonel varney went to a desk in the corner of the room unlocked it drew forth a black book and running his fingers through the pages stopped at the letter k yes sent back his legislative pass but i've known him to do that when they were holding out for something more there must be somebody who can get close to him the colonel ruminated a while then he strode to the door and called out to the group of men who were always lounging in the hall tell alf young i want to see him fred I waited, by no means free from uneasiness and anxiety, from a certain lack of self-respect that was unfamiliar. Mr. Young, the colonel explained, was a legal light in Galesburg, near Elkington, the railroad lawyer there. And when at last Mr. Young appeared, he proved to be an oily gentleman of about forty, inclining to stoutness, with one of those blue, shaven faces. "'Want me, colonel?' he inquired blithely when the door had closed behind him and added obsequiously when introduced to me glad to meet you mr parrott my regards to mr watling when you go back elf demanded the colonel what do you know of this fellow krebs mr young laughed krebs was nutty he declared that was all there was to it won't he listen to reason it's been tried colonel say he wouldn't know a hundred dollar bill if you showed him one what does he want oh something that's sure they all want something mr young shrugged his shoulder expressively and by a skilful manipulation of his lips shifted his cigar from one side of his mouth to the other without raising his hands 
but it ain't money i guess he's got a notion that later on the labor unions will send him to the united states senate some day he's no slouch either when it comes to the law i can tell you that no no flaw in his record colonel varney's agate eye sought those of mr young meaningly that's been tried too declared the galesburg attorney say you can believe it or not but we've never dug anything up so far he's been too slick for us i guess well exclaimed the colonel at length let him squeal and be damned he can't do any more than make a noise only i hoped we'd be able to grease this thing along and slide it through the senate this afternoon before they got wind of it he'll squeal all right until you smother him mr young observed we'll smother him some day replied the colonel savagely mr young laughed but as i made my way toward the state house i was conscious of a feeling of relief i had no sooner gained a front seat in the gallery of the house of representatives when the members rose the senate marched gravely in the speaker stopped jesting with the chaplain and over the chaplain's face came suddenly an agonized expression folding his hands across his stomach he began to call on god with terrific fervor in an intense and resounding voice i was struck suddenly by the irony of it all why have a legislature when colonel paul varney was so efficient the legislature was a mere sop to democratic prejudice to pray over it heightened the travesty suppose there were a god after all not necessarily the magnified monarch to whom these pseudo-democrats prayed but an intelligent force that makes for righteousness how did he or it like to be trifled with in this way and if he existed would not his disgust be immeasurable as he contemplated that unctuous figure in the prince albert coat who pretended to represent him as the routine business began i searched for krebs to find him presently at a desk beside a window in the rear of the hall making notes on a paper there was confessedly little satisfaction in the thought that the man whose gaunt figures i contemplated was merely one of those impractical idealists who beat themselves to pieces against the forces that sway the world and must forever sway it i should be compelled to admit that he represented something unique in that assembly if he had the courage to get up and oppose house bill seven hundred nine i watched him narrowly the suggestion intruded itself perhaps he had been seen as the colonel expressed it i repudiated it i grew impatient feverish the monotonous reading of the clerk was interrupted now and then by the sharp tones of the speaker assigning his various measures to this or that committee unless objection is offered while the members moved about and murmured among themselves krebs had stopped making notes he was looking out of the window at last without any change of emphasis in his droning voice the clerk announced the recommendation of the committee on judiciary that house bill seven hundred nine ought to pass down in front a man had risen from his seat the felicitous mr truesdale glancing around at his fellow members he then began to explain in the impressive but conversational tone of one whose counsels are in the habit of being listened to that this was merely a little measure to remedy a flaw in the statutes mr truesdale believed in corporations when corporations were good and this bill was calculated to make them good to put an end to jugglery and concealment our great state he said should be in the forefront of such wise legislation which made for justice and a proper publicity but the bill in question was of greater interest to lawyers than to laymen a committee composed largely of lawyers had recommended it unanimously and he was sure that no opposition would develop in the house in order not to take up their time he asked therefore that it be immediately put on its second and third reading and allowed to pass he sat down and i looked at krebs could he could any man any lawyer have the presumption to question such an obviously desirable measure 
to arraign the united judgment of the committee's legal talent such was the note mr truesdale so admirably struck as though fascinated i continued to gaze at krebs i hated him i desired to see him humiliated and yet amazingly i found myself wishing with almost equal vehemence that he would be true to himself he was rising slowly timidly i thought his hand clutching his desk lid his voice sounding wholly inadequate as he addressed the speaker the speaker hesitated his tone palpably supercilious the gentleman from from elkington mr krebs there was a craning of necks a staring a tittering i burned with vicarious shame as krebs stood there awkwardly his hand still holding the desk there were cries of louder when he began some picked up their newspapers while others started conversations the speaker rapped with his gavel and i failed to hear the opening words krebs paused and began again his speech did not at first flow easily mr speaker i rise to protest against this bill which in my opinion is not so innocent as the gentleman from st helens would have the house believe it is on a par indeed with other legislation that in past years has been engineered through this legislature under the guise of beneficent law no not on a par it is the most arrogant the most monstrous example of special legislation of them all and while i do not expect to be able to delay its passage much longer than the time i shall be on my feet then why not sit down came a voice just audible as he turned swiftly toward the offender his profile had an eagle-like effect that startled me seemingly realizing a new quality in the man it was as though he had needed just the stimulus of that interruption to electrify and transform him his awkwardness disappeared and if he was a little bombastic a little young he spoke with the fire of conviction because he cried because i should lose my self-respect for life if i sat here and permitted the political organization of a railroad the members of which are here under the guise of servants of the people to cow me into silence and if it be treason to mention the name of that railroad in connection with its political tyranny then make the most of it he let go of the desk and tapped the copy of the bill what are the facts the Boyne Iron Works, under the presidency of Adolf Scherer, has been engaged in litigation with the Ribblevale Steel Company for some years, and this bill is intended to put into the hands of the attorneys for Mr. Scherer certain information that will enable him to get possession of the property. Gentlemen, that is what legal practice has descended to in the hands of respectable lawyers this device originated with the resourceful mr theodore watling and if it had not had the approval of mr miller gorse it would never have got any farther than the judiciary committee it was confided to the skilful care of colonel paul varney to be steered through this legislature as hundreds of other measures have been steered through without unnecessary noise it may be asked why the railroad should bother itself by lending its political organization to private corporations i will tell you because corporations like the boyne corporation are a part of a network of interests these corporations aid the railroad to maintain its monopoly and in return receive rebates krebs had raised his voice as the murmurs became louder at this point a sharp-faced lawyer from belfast got to his feet and objected that the gentleman from elkington was wasting the time of the house indulging in hearsay his remarks were not germane etc the speaker rapped again with a fine show of impartiality and cautioned the member from elkington very well replied krebs i have said what i wanted to say on that score and i know it to be the truth and if this house does not find it germane the day is coming when its constituents will
whereupon he entered into a discussion of the bill dissecting it with more calmness with an ability that must have commanded even from some hostile minds an unwilling respect the penalty he said was outrageous hitherto unheard of in law putting a corporation in the hands of a receiver at the mercy of those who coveted it because one of its officers refused or was unable to testify he might be in china or timbuktu when the summons was delivered at his last or usual place of abode here was an enormity an exercise of tyrannical power exceeding all bounds a travesty on popular government he ended by pointing out the significance of the fact that the committee had given no hearings by declaring that if the bill became a law it would inevitably react upon the heads of those who were responsible for it he sat down and there was a flutter of applause from the scattered audience in the gallery by god that's the only man in the whole place i was aware for the first time of a neighbour at my side a solid red-faced man evidently a farmer his trousers were tucked into his boots and his gnarled and powerful hands ingrained with dirt clutched the arms of the seat as he leaned forward didn't he just naturally lambaste em he cried excitedly they'll down him i guess but say he's right a man would lose his self-respect if he didn't let out his mind at them hoss thieves wouldn't he what's that fellow's name i told him krebs he repeated i want to remember that durned if i don't shake hands with him his excitement astonished me would the public feel like that if they only knew the speaker's gavel had come down like a pistol shot one war hoss as my neighbour called them after another proceeded to crush the member from elkington it was indeed very skilfully done and yet it was a process from which i did not derive somehow much pleasure colonel varney's army had been magnificently trained to meet just this kind of situation some employed ridicule others declared in impassioned tones that the good name of their state had been wantonly assailed and pointed fervently to portraits on the walls of patriots of the past sentiments that drew applause from the fickle gallery one gentleman observed that the obsession of a railroad machine was a sure symptom of a certain kind of insanity of which the first speaker had given many other evidences the farmer at my side remained staunch they can't fool me he said angrily i know em do you see that fellow getting up to talk now well i could tell you a few things about him all right he comes from glasgow and his name's letchworth he's done more harm in his life than all the criminals he's kept out of prison belongs to one of the old families down there too i had indeed remarked letchworth's face which seemed to me peculiarly evil its lividity enhanced by a shock of grey hair his method was withering sarcasm and he was clearly unable to control his animus no champion appeared to support krebs who sat pale and tense while this denunciation of him was going on finally he got the floor his voice trembled a little whether with passion excitement or nervousness it was impossible to say but he contented himself with a brief defiance if the bill passed he declared the men who voted for it the men who were behind it would ultimately be driven from political life by an indignant public he had a higher opinion of the voters of the state than those who accused him of slandering it than those who sat silent and had not lifted their voices against this crime when the bill was put to a vote he demanded a roll call ten members besides himself were recorded against house bill number seven hundred nine in spite of this overwhelming triumph my feelings were not wholly those of satisfaction when i returned to the hotel and listened to the exultations and denunciations of such politicians as letchworth young and colonel varney perhaps an image suggesting herman krebs as some splendid animal at bay dragged down by the hounds is too strong he had been ingloriously crushed and defeat 
even for the sake of conviction was not an inspiring spectacle as the chase swept on over his prostrate figure i rapidly regained poise and a sense of proportion a master of life could not permit himself to be tossed about by sentimentality and gradually i grew ashamed of my bad quarter of an hour in the gallery of the house and of the effect of it which lingered a while as of a weakness suddenly revealed which must at all costs be overcome i began to see something dramatic and sensational in krebs's performance the Ripplevale Steel Company was the real quarry, after all, and such had been the expedition, the skill and secrecy with which our affair was conducted, that before the Ripplevale lawyers could arrive, alarmed and breathless, the bill had passed the house, and their only real chance of halting it had been lost. For the railroad controlled the house, not by owning the individuals composing it, but through the leaders who dominated it men like letchworth and truesdale these and colonel varney had seen to it that men who had any parliamentary ability had been attended to all save krebs who had proved a surprise there were indeed certain members who although they had railroad passes in their pockets which were regarded as just perquisites the railroad being so rich would have opposed the bill if they had felt sufficiently sure of themselves to cope with such veterans as letchworth many of these had allowed themselves to be won over or cowed by the oratory which had crushed krebs nor did the ripplevale people be it recorded scruple to fight fire with fire their existence of course was at stake and there was no public to appeal to a part of the legal army that rushed to the aid of our adversaries spent the afternoon and most of the night organizing all those who could be induced by one means or another to reverse their sentiments and in searching for the few who had grievances against the existing power the following morning a motion was introduced to reconsider and in the debate that followed krebs still defiant took an active part but the resolution required a two-thirds vote and was lost when the battle was shifted to the senate it was as good as lost the judiciary committee of the august body did indeed condescend to give hearings at which the ripplevale lawyers exhausted their energy and ingenuity without result with only two dissenting votes the bill was calmly passed in vain was the governor besieged entreated threatened it was said mr trulys had informed protesters so colonel varney gleefully reported that he had become fully convinced of the inherent justice of the measure on saturday morning he signed it and it became a law colonel varney as he accompanied me to the train did not conceal his jubilation perhaps i ought not to say it mr parrott but it couldn't have been done neater that's the art in these little affairs to get em runnin fast to get momentum on em before the other party wakes up and then he can't stop em as he shook hands in farewell he added with more gravity we'll see each other often sir i guess my very best regards to mr watling needless to say i had not confided to him the part i had played in originating house bill number seven hundred nine now a law of the state but as the train rolled on through the sunny winter landscape a sense of well-being of importance and power began to steal through me i was victoriously bearing home my first scalp one which was by no means to be despised it was not until we reached rossiter about five o'clock that i was able to get the evening newspapers such was the perfection of the organization of which i might now call myself an integral part that the best publications contained only the barest mention and that in the legislative news of the signing of the bill i read with complacency and even with amusement the flaring headlines i had anticipated in mr lawler's pilot the governor signs it special legislation forced through by the railroad lobby which will drive honest corporations from this state ripple vale steel company the victim it was common talk in the capital the article went on to say 
that theodore watling himself had drawn up the measure perusing the editorial page my eye fell on the name krebs one member of the legislature above all deserved the gratitude of the people of the state the member from elkington an unknown man elected in spite of the opposition of the machine he had dared to raise his voice against this iniquity etc etc we had won that was the essential thing and my legal experience had taught me that victory counts defeat is soon forgotten even the discontented half-baked and heterogeneous element from which the pilot got its circulation had short memories End of section 11section twelve of a far country by winston churchill this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter eleven the next morning which was sunday i went to mr watling's house in fillmore street a new residence at that time being admired as the dernier cri in architecture it had a medieval look queer dormers in a steep roof of red tiles leaded windows buried deep in walls of rough stone emerging from the recessed vestibule on a level with the street were the watling twins aglow with health dressed in identical costumes of blue they had made their bow to society that winter why here's hugh said francis doesn't he look pleased with himself he's come to take us to church said janet oh he's much too important said francis he's made a killing of some sort haven't you hugh i rang the bell and stood watching them as they departed reflecting that i was thirty-two years of age and unmarried mr watling surrounded with newspapers and seated before his library fire glanced up at me with a welcoming smile how had i borne the legislative baptism of fire such i knew was its implication everything went according to schedule eh well i congratulate you hugh he said oh i didn't have much to do with it i answered smiling back at him i kept out of sight that's an art in itself i had an opportunity at close range to study the methods in our lawmakers they're not particularly edifying mr watling replied but they seem unfortunately to be necessary such had been my own thought who is this man krebs he inquired suddenly and why didn't varney get hold of him and make him listen to reason i am afraid it wouldn't have been any use i replied he was in my class at harvard i knew him slightly he worked his way through and had a pretty hard time of it i imagine it affected his ideas what is he a socialist something of the sort in theodore watling's vigorous sanity exhaling presence krebs's act appeared fantastic ridiculous he has queer notions about a new kind of democracy which he says is coming i think he is the kind of man who would be willing to die for it what in these days mr watling looked at me incredulously if that's so we must keep an eye on him a sincere fanatic is a good deal more dangerous than a reformer who wants something there are such men he added but they are rare how was the governor trulice he asked suddenly tractable behaved like a lamb although he insisted upon going through with his little humbug i said mr watling laughed they always do he observed and waste a lot of valuable time you'll find some light cigars in the corner hugh i sat down beside him and we spent the morning going over the details of the ribblevale suit mr watling delegating to me certain matters connected with it of a kind with which i had not hitherto been entrusted and he spoke again before i left of his intention of taking me into the firm as soon as the affair could be arranged walking homeward with my mind intent upon things to come i met my mother at the corner of lime street coming from church her face lighted up at sight of me have you been working to-day hugh she asked i explained that i had spent the morning with mr watling 
i'll tell you a secret mother i'm going to be taken into the firm oh my dear i'm so glad she exclaimed i often think if only your father were alive how happy he would be and how proud of you i wish he could know perhaps he does know theodore watling had once said to me that the man who can best keep his own counsel is the best counsel for other men to keep i did not go about boasting of the part i had played in originating the now famous bill number seven hundred nine the passage of which had brought about the capitulation of the ripplevale steel company to our clients but ralph hambleton knew of it of course that was a pretty good thing you pulled off hughie he said i didn't think you had it in you it was rank patronage of course yet i was secretly pleased as the years went on i was thrown more and more with him though in boyhood there had been between us no bond of sympathy about this time he was beginning to increase very considerably the hambleton fortune and a little later i became counsel for the crescent gas and electric company in which he had shrewdly gained a controlling interest even toward the colossal game of modern finance his attitude was characteristically that of the dilettante of the amateur he played it as it were contemptuously even as he had played poker at harvard with a cynical audacity that had a peculiarly disturbing effect upon his companions he bluffed he raised the limit in spite of protests and when he lost one always had the feeling that he would ultimately get his money back twice over at the conferences in the boyne club which he often attended his manner toward mr dickinson and mr scherer and even toward miller gorse was frequently one of thinly veiled amusement at their seriousness i often wondered that they did not resent it but he was a privileged person his cousin ham durrett whose inheritance was even greater than ralph's had been had also become a privileged person whose comings and goings and more reputable doings were often recorded in the newspapers ham had attained to what jean hollister aptly but inadvertently called notoriety as ralph wittily remarked ham gave to polo and women that which might have gone into high finance he spent much of his time in the east his conduct there and at home would once have created a black scandal in our community but we were gradually leaving our calvinism behind us and growing more tolerant we were ready to forgive much to wealth especially if it was inherited hostesses lamented the fact that ham was wild but they asked him to dinners and dances to meet their daughters if some moralist better educated and more far-seeing than perry blackwood for perry had become a moralist had told these hostesses that hambleton durrett was a victim of our new civilization they would have raised their eyebrows they deplored while they coveted if ham had been told he was a victim of any sort he would have laughed he enjoyed life he was genial and jovial both lavish and parsimonious this latter characteristic being the curious survival of the trait of the ancestors to which he owed his millions he was growing even heavier and decidedly red in the face perry used to take ralph to task for not saving ham from his iniquities and ralph would reply that ham was going to the devil anyway and not even the devil himself could stop him you can stop him and you know it perry retorted indignantly what do you want me to do with him asked ralph convert him to the saintly life i lead this was a poser that's a fact said perry you're no better than he is i don't know what you mean by better retorted ralph grinning i'm wiser that's all we had been talking about the ethics of business when perry had switched off to ham i believe at least in restraint of trade ham doesn't believe in restraint of any kind when therefore the news suddenly began to be circulated in the boyne club that ham was showing a tendency to straighten up surprise and incredulity were genuine he was drinking less much less and it was said that he had severed certain ties that need not again be definitely mentioned 
the theory of religious regeneration not being tenable it was naturally supposed that he had fallen in love the identity of the unknown lady becoming a fruitful subject of speculation among the feminine portion of society the announcement of the marriage of hambleton durrett would be news of the first magnitude to be absorbed eagerly by the many who had not the honour of his acquaintance comparable only to that of a devastating flood or a murder mystery or a change in the tariff being absorbed in affairs that seemed more important the subject did not interest me greatly but one sunday afternoon as i made my way in answer to her invitation to see nancy willett i found myself wondering idly whether she might not be by way of making a shrewd guess as to the object of hambleton's affections it was well known that he had entertained a hopeless infatuation for her and some were inclined to attribute his later lapses to her lack of response he still called on her and her lectures which she delivered like a great aunt with a recondite knowledge of the world he took meekly but even she had seemed powerless to alter his habits powell street that happy hunting ground of my youth had changed its character become contracted and unfamiliar sooty the macallaries and other old families who had not decayed with the neighbourhood were rapidly deserting it moving out to the new residence district known as the heights i came to the willett house that too had an air of shabbiness of well-tended shabbiness to be sure the stone steps had been scrupulously scrubbed but one of them was cracked clear across and the silver on the polished nameplate was wearing off even the act of pulling the knob of a doorbell was becoming obsolete so used had we grown to pushing porcelain buttons in bright new vestibules as i waited for my summons to be answered it struck me as remarkable that neither nancy nor her father had been contaminated by the shabbiness that surrounded them she had managed rather marvellously to redeem one room from the old-fashioned severity of the rest of the house the library behind the big parlour it was nancy's room eloquent of her daintiness and taste of her essential modernity and luxuriousness and that evening as i was ushered into it this quality of luxuriousness of being able to shut out the disagreeable aspects of life that surrounded and threatened her particularly impressed me she had not lacked opportunities to escape i wondered uneasily as i waited why she had not embraced them i strayed about the room a coal fire burned in the grate the red shaded lamps gave a subdued but cheerful light some impulse led me to cross over to the windows and draw aside the heavy hangings dusk was gathering over that garden bleak and frozen now where we had romped together as children how queer the place seemed how shrivelled once it had had the wide range of a park there still weathering the elements was the old-fashioned latticed summer-house but the fruit trees that i recalled as clouds of pink and white were gone a touch of poignancy was in these memories i dropped the curtain and turned to confront nancy who had entered noiselessly well hugh were you dreaming she said not exactly i replied embarrassed i was looking at the garden the soot has ruined it my life seems to be one continual struggle against the soot the blacks as the english call them it's a more expressive term they are like an army you know overwhelming in their relentless invasion well do sit down it is nice of you to come you'll have some tea won't you the maid had brought in the tray afternoon tea was still rather a new custom with us more of a ceremony than a meal and as nancy handed me my cup and the thinnest of slices of bread and butter i found the intimacy of the situation a little disquieting her manner was indeed intimate and yet it had the odd and disturbing effect of making her seem more remote as she chatted i answered her perfunctorily while all the time i was asking myself why i had ceased to desire her whether the old longing for her might not return was not even now returning 
i might indeed go far afield to find a wife so suited to me as nancy she had beauty distinction and position she was a woman of whom any man might be proud i haven't congratulated you yet hugh she said suddenly now that you are a partner of mr watling's i hear on all sides that you are on the high road to a great success of course i'm glad to be in the firm i admitted it was a new tack for nancy rather a disquieting one this discussion of my affairs which she had so long avoided or ignored you are getting what you have always wanted aren't you i wondered in some trepidation whether by that word always she was making a deliberate reference to the past always i repeated rather fatuously nearly always ever since you have been a man i was incapable of taking advantage of the opening if it were one she was baffling a man likes to succeed in his profession of course i said and you made up your mind to succeed more deliberately than most men i needn't ask if you are satisfied hugh success seems to agree with you although i imagine you will never be satisfied why do you say that i demanded i haven't known you all your life for nothing i think i know you much better than you know yourself you haven't acted as if you did i exclaimed she smiled have you been interested in what i thought about you she asked that isn't quite fair nancy i protested you haven't given me much evidence that you think about me have i received much encouragement to do so she inquired but you haven't seemed to invite you've kept me at arm's length oh don't fence she cried rather sharply i had become agitated but her next words gave me a shock that was momentarily paralyzing i asked you to come here to-day hugh because i wished you to know that i have made up my mind to marry hambleton durrett hambleton durrett i echoed stupidly hambleton durrett why not have you have you accepted him no but i mean to do so you you love him i don't see what right you have to ask but you just said that you invited me here to talk frankly no i don't love him then why in heaven's name are you going to marry him she lay back in her chair regarding me her lips slightly parted all at once the full flavour of her the superfine quality was revealed after years of blindness nor can i describe the sudden rebellion the revulsion that i experienced hambleton durrett it was an outrage a sacrilege i got up and put my hand on the mantel nancy remained motionless inert her head lying back against the chair could it be that she were enjoying my discomfiture there is no need to confess that i knew next to nothing of women had i been less excited i might have made the discovery that i still regarded them sentimentally certain romantic axioms concerning them garnered from victorian literature passed current in my mind for wisdom and one of these declared that they were prone to remain true to an early love did nancy still care for me the query coming as it did on top of my emotion brought with it a strange and overwhelming perplexity did i really care for her the many years during which i had practised the habit of caution began to exert an inhibiting pressure here was a situation an opportunity suddenly thrust upon me which might never return and which i was utterly unprepared to meet would i be happy with nancy after all her expression was still enigmatic why shouldn't i marry him she demanded because he's not good enough for you good she exclaimed and laughed he loves me he wants me without reservation or calculation 
there was a sting in this and is he any worse she asked slowly than many others who might be mentioned no i agreed i did not intend to be led into the thankless and disagreeable position of condemning hambleton durrett but why have you waited all these years if you did not mean to marry a man of ability a man who has made something of himself a man like you hugh she said gently i flushed that isn't quite fair nancy what are you working for she suddenly inquired straightening up what any man works for i suppose ah there you have hit it what any man works for in our world power personal power you want to be somebody isn't that it not the noblest ambition you'll have to admit not the kind of thing we used to dream about when we did dream well when we find we can't realize our dreams we take the next best thing and i fail to see why you should blame me for taking it when you yourself have taken it hambleton durrett can give it to me he'll accept me on my own terms he won't interfere with me i shan't be disillusionized and i shall have a position which i could not hope to have if i remained unmarried a very marked position as hambleton durrett's wife i am thirty you know her frankness appalled me the trouble with you hugh is that you still deceive yourself you throw a glamour over things you want to keep your cake and eat it too i don't see why you say that and marriage especially she took me up marriage what other career is open to a woman unless she is married and married well according to the money standard you men have set up she's nobody we can't all be florence nightingales and i am unable to imagine myself a julia ward howe or a harriet beecher stowe what is left nothing but marriage i'm hard and cynical you will say but i have thought and i'm not afraid as i have told you to look things in the face there are very few women i think who would not take the real thing if they had the chance before it were too late who wouldn't be willing to do their own cooking in order to get it she fell silent suddenly i began to pace the room for god's sake don't do this nancy i begged but she continued to stare into the fire as though she had not heard me if you'd made up your mind to do it why did you tell me i asked sentiment i suppose i am paying a tribute to what i once was to what you once were she said a a sort of good-bye to sentiment nancy i said hoarsely she shook her head no hugh surely you can't misjudge me so she answered reproachfully do you think i should have sent for you if i had meant that no no i don't think so but why not you you cared once and you tell me plainly you don't love him it was all a terrible mistake we were meant for each other i did love you then she said you never knew how much and there is nothing i wouldn't give to bring it all back again but i can't it's gone you're gone and i'm gone i mean what we were oh why did you change it was you who changed i declared bewildered couldn't you see can't you see now what you did but perhaps you couldn't help it perhaps it was just you after all what i did why couldn't you have held fast to your faith if you had you would have known what it was i adored in you oh i don't mind telling you now it was just that faith hugh that faith you had in life that faith you had in me you weren't cynical and calculating like ralph hambleton you had imagination i i dreamed too and do you remember the time when you made the boat and we went to logan's pond and you sank in her and you stayed i went on when all the others ran away you ran down the hill like a whirlwind she laughed 
and then you came here one day to a party and said you were going to harvard and quarrelled with me why did you doubt me i asked agitatedly why didn't you let me see that you still cared because that wasn't you hugh that wasn't your real self do you suppose it mattered to me whether you went to harvard with the others oh i was foolish too i know i shouldn't have said what i did but what is the use of regrets she exclaimed we've both run after the practical gods and the others have hidden their faces from us it may be that we are not to blame either of us that the practical gods are too strong we've learned to love and worship them and now we can't do without them we can try nancy i pleaded no she answered in a low voice that's the difference between you and me i know myself better than you know yourself and i know you better she smiled again unless we could have it all back again i shouldn't want any of it you do not love me i started once more to protest no no don't say it she cried you may think you do just this moment but it's only because you've been moved and what you believe you want isn't me it's what i was but i'm not that any more i'm simply recalling that don't you see and even then you wouldn't wish me now as i was that sounds involved but you must understand you want a woman who will be wrapped up in your career hugh and yet you will not share it who will devote herself body and soul to what you have become a woman whom you can shape and you won't really love her but only just so much of her as may become the incarnation of you well i'm not that kind of woman i might have been had you been different i'm not at all sure certainly i'm not that kind now even though i know in my heart that the sort of career you have made for yourself and that i intend to make for myself is all dross but now i can't do without it and yet you're going to marry hambleton turret i said she understood me although i regretted my words at once yes i am going to marry him there was a shade of bitterness of defiance in her voice surely you are not offering me the the other thing now oh hugh i am willing to abandon it all nancy no she said you're not and i'm not what you can't see and won't see is that it has become part of you oh you are successful you will be more and more successful and you think i should be somebody as your wife hugh more perhaps eventually than i shall be as hambleton's but i should be nobody too i couldn't stand it now my dear you must realize that as soon as you have time to think it over we shall be friends the sudden gentleness in her voice pierced me through and through she held out her hand something in her grasp spoke of a resolution which could not be shaken and besides she added sadly i don't love you any more hugh i'm mourning for something that's gone i wanted to have just this one talk with you but we shan't mention it again we'll close the book at that i fled out of the house and at first the thought of her as another man's wife as hambleton durrett's wife was seemingly not to be borne it was incredible we'll close the book i found myself repeating the phrase and it seemed then as though something within me i had believed dead something that formerly had been all of me had revived again to throb with pain it is not surprising that the acuteness of my suffering was of short duration though i remember certain sharp twinges when the announcement of the engagement burst on the city there was much controversy over the question as to whether or not ham durrett's reform would be permanent but most people were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt it was time he settled down and took the position in the community that was to be expected of one of his name and as for nancy it was generally agreed that she had done well for herself she was not made for poverty 
and who so well as she was fitted for the social leadership of our community they were married in trinity church in the month of may and i was one of ham's attendants ralph was best man for the last time the old willett mansion in powell street wore the gala air of former days carpets were spread over the sidewalk and red and white awnings rooms were filled with flour and flung open to hundreds of guests i found the wedding something of an ordeal i do not like to dwell upon it especially upon that moment when i came to congratulate nancy as she stood beside ham at the end of the long parlour she seemed to have no regrets i don't know what i expected of her certainly not tears and tragedy she seemed taller than ever and very beautiful in her veil and white satin gown and the diamonds ham had given her very much mistress of herself quite a contrast to ham who made no secret of his elation she smiled when i wished her happiness we'll be home in the autumn hugh and expect to see a great deal of you she said as i paused in a corner of the room my eye fell upon nancy's father mcillary willett's elation seemed even greater than ham's with a gardenia in his frock coat and a glass of champagne in his hand he went from group to group and his familiar laughter which once had seemed so full of merriment and fun gave me to-day a somewhat scandalized feeling i heard ralph's voice and turned to discover him standing beside me his long legs thrust slightly apart his hands in his pockets overlooking the scene with typical semi-contemptuous amusement this lets old mcillary out anyway he said what do you mean i demanded one or two little notes of his will be cancelled sooner or later that's all for a moment i was unable to speak and do you think that she that nancy found out i stammered well i'd be willing to take that end of the bet he replied why the deuce should she marry ham you ought to know her well enough to understand how she'd feel if she discovered some of mcillary's financial coups of course it's not a thing to talk about you understand are you going to the club no i'm going home i said i was aware of his somewhat compassionate smile as i left him End of section 12section thirteen of a far country by winston churchill this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter twelve part one one november day nearly two years after my admission as junior member of the firm of watling founds and ripon seven gentlemen met at luncheon in the boyne club mr barber president of the railroad mr scherer of the boyne iron works and other corporations mr leonard dickinson of the corn national bank mr halsey a prominent banker from the other great city of the state mr grunewald chairman of the republican state committee and mr frederick grierson who had become a very important man in our community at four o'clock they emerged from the club citizens in boyne street who saw them chatting amicably on the steps little suspected that in the last three hours these gentlemen had chosen and practically elected the man who was to succeed mr wade as united states senator in washington those were the days in which great affairs were simply and efficiently handled no democratic nonsense about leaving the choice to an electorate that did not know what it wanted the man chosen to fill this high position was theodore watling he said he would think about the matter in the nation at large through the defection of certain northern states neither so conservative nor fortunate as ours the democratic party was in power which naturally implies financial depression there was no question about our ability to send a republican senator the choice in the boyne club was final but before the legislature should ratify it a year or so hence it were just as well that the people of the state should be convinced that they desired mr watling more than any other man and surely enough 
in a little while such a conviction sprang up spontaneously in offices and restaurants and hotels men began to suggest to each other what a fine thing it would be if theodore watling might be persuaded to accept the toga at the banks when customers called to renew their notes and tight money was discussed and democrats excoriated it was generally agreed that the obvious thing to do was to get a safe man in the senate from the very first watling's sentiment stirred like spring sap after a hard winter the country newspapers watered by providential rains began to put forth tender little editorial shoots which mr judah b talent presently collected and presented in a charming bouquet in the morning era the voice of the state press thus was the column headed and the remarks of the hon fitch truesdale of the st helens messenger were given a special prominence mr truesdale was the first in his section to be inspired by the happy thought that the one man pre-eminently fitted to represent the state in the present crisis when her great industries had been crippled by democratic folly was mr theodore watling the rossiter banner the elkington star the belfast recorder and i know not how many others simultaneously began to sing mr watling's praises not since the troublous times of the civil war declared the morning era had the demand for any man been so unanimous as a proof of it there were the country newspapers which reflected the sober opinion of the firesides of the common people there are certain industrious gentlemen to whom little credit is given and who unlike the average citizen who reserves his enthusiasm for election time are patriotic enough to labour for their country's good all the year round when in town it was their habit to pay a friendly call on the council for the railroad mr miller gorse in the corn bank building he was never too busy to converse with them or it might be better said to listen to them converse let some legally and politically ambitious young man observe mr gorse's method did he inquire what the party worker thought of mr watling for the senate not at all but before the party worker left he was telling mr gortz that public sentiment demanded mr watling after leaving mr gortz they wended their way to the durrett building and handed their cards over the rail of the offices of watling founds and ripon mr watling shook hands with scores of them and they departed well satisfied with the flavour of his cigars and intoxicated by his personality he had a marvellous way of cutting short an interview without giving offence some of them he turned over to mr parrot whom he particularly desired they should know thus mr parrot acquired many valuable additions to his acquaintance cultivated a memory for names and faces that was to stand him in good stead and kept besides an indexed notebook into which he put various bits of interesting information concerning each though not immediately lucrative it was all no doubt part of a lawyer's education during the summer and the following winter colonel paul varney came often to town and spent much of his time in mr parrot's office smoking mr watling's cigars and discussing the coming campaign in which he took a whole-souled interest say hugh this is goin slick he would exclaim his eyes glittering like round buttons of jet i never saw a campaign where they fell in the way they're doing now if it was anybody else but theodore watling it would scare me you ought to have been in jim broadhurst's campaign he added referring to the junior senator they wouldn't wood up at all they was just listless but gorse and barber and the rest wanted him and we had to put him over i reckon he is useful down there in washington but say do you know what he always reminded me of one of those mud turtles i used to play with as a boy up in columbia county shuts up tight soon as he sees you coming now theodore watling ain't like that any way of speaking we can get up some enthusiasm for a man of his sort he's liberal and big he's made his pile and he don't begrudge some of it to the fellows who do the work mark my words when you see a man who wants a big office cheap look out for him <laughs>
this and much more wisdom i imbibed while assenting to my chief's greatness for mr varney was right one could feel enthusiasm for theodore watling and my growing intimacy with him the sense that i was having a part in his career a share in his success became for the moment the passion of my life as the campaign progressed i gave more and more time to it and made frequent trips of a confidential nature to the different counties of the state the whole of my being was energized the national fever had thoroughly pervaded my blood the national fever to win prosperity writ large demanded it and theodore watling personified incarnated the cause i had neither the time nor the desire to philosophize on this national fever which animated all my associates animated i might say the nation which was beginning to get into a fever about games if i remember rightly it was about this time that golf was introduced tennis had become a commonplace professional baseball was in full swing ham durrett had even organized a local polo team the man who failed to win something tangible in sport or law or business or politics was counted out such was the spirit of america in the closing years of the nineteenth century and yet when one has said this one has failed to express the national geist in all its subtlety in brief the great american sport was not so much to win the game as to beat it the evasion of rules challenged our ingenuity and having won we set about devising methods whereby it would be less and less possible for us winners to lose in the future no better illustration of this tendency could be given than the development which had recently taken place in the field of our city politics hitherto the battleground of irish politicians who had fought one another for supremacy individualism had been rampant competition the custom you bought an alderman or a boss who owned four or five aldermen and then you never could be sure you were to get what you wanted or that the aldermen and the bosses would stay bought but now a genius had appeared an american genius who had arisen swiftly and almost silently who appealed to the imagination and whose name was often mentioned in a whisper the honourable judd jason sometimes known as the spider who organised the city hall and capitalised it an ultimate and logical effect if one had considered it of the manchester school of economics enlightened self interest stripped of sentiment ends on judd jason's he ran the city even as mr sherrill ran his department store you paid your price it was very convenient being a genius mr jason did not wholly break with tradition but retained those elements of the old muddled system that had their value chartering steamboats for outings on the river giving colossal picnics in lowry park the poor and the wanderer and the criminal of the male sex at least were cared for but he was not loved as the rough and tumble irishman had been loved he did not make himself common he was surrounded by an aura of mystery which i confess had not failed of effect on me once and only once during my legal apprenticeship he had been pointed out to me on the street where he rarely ventured his appearance was not impressive mr jason could not of course prevent mr watling's election even did he so desire but he did command the allegiance of several city candidates both democratic and republican for the state legislature who had as yet failed to announce their preferences for united states senator it was important that mr watling's vote should be large as indicative of a public reaction and repudiation of democratic national folly this matter among others was the subject of discussion one july morning when the republican state chairman was in the city mr grunewald expressed anxiety over mr jason's continued silence it was expedient that somebody should see the boss why not parrot suggested leonard dickinson mr watling was not present at this conference parrot seems to be running watling's campaign anyway it was settled that i should be the emissary 
with lively sensations of curiosity and excitement tempered by a certain anxiety as to my ability to match wits with the spider i made my way to his lair over monahan's saloon situated in a district that was anything but respectable the saloon on the ground floor had two apartments the bar-room proper where mike monahan chamberlain of the establishment was wont to stand red-faced and smiling to greet the courtiers big and little the party workers the district leaders the hangers-on ready to be hired the city officials the police judges yes and the dignified members of the state courts whose elections depended on mr jason's favour even judge baring whose acquaintance i had made the day i had come as a law student to mr watling's office unbent from time to time sufficiently to call there for a small glass of rye and water and to relate with his owl-like gravity an anecdote to the boys the saloon represented democracy so dear to the american public here all were welcome even the light-fingered gentlemen who enjoyed the privilege of police protection and who sometimes through fortuitous circumstances were hauled before the very magistrates with whom they had rubbed elbows on the polished rail behind the bar-room and separated from it by swinging doors only the elite ventured to thrust apart was an audience chamber whither mr jason occasionally descended anecdote and political reminiscence gave place here to matters of high policy i had several times come to the saloon in the days of my apprenticeship in search of some judge or official and once i had run down here the city auditor himself mike monahan whose affair it was to know every one recognized me it was part of his business also to understand that i was now a member of the firm of watling founds and ripon good morning to you mr parrot he said suavely we held a colloquy in undertones over the bar eyed by the two or three customers who were present mr monahan disappeared but presently returned to whisper sure he'll see you to lead the way through the swinging doors and up a dark stairway i came suddenly on a room in the greatest disorder its tables and chairs piled high with newspapers and letters its windows streaked with soot from an open door on its farther side issued a voice is that you mr parrot come in here it was little less than a command heard of you mr parrot glad to know you sit down won't you the inner room was almost dark i made out a bed in the corner and propped up in the bed a man but for the moment i was most aware of a pair of eyes that flared up when the man spoke and died down again when he became silent they reminded me of those insects which in my childhood days we called lightning bugs mr jason gave me a hand like a woman's i expressed my pleasure at meeting him and took a chair beside the bed i believe you're a partner of theodore watling's now aren't you smart man watling he'll make a good senator i replied accepting the opening you think he'll get elected do you mr jason inquired i laughed well there isn't much doubt about that i imagine don't know don't know seen some dead sure things go wrong in my time what's going to defeat him i asked pleasantly i don't say anything mr jason replied but i've known funny things to happen never does to be dead sure oh well we're as sure as it's humanly possible to be i declared the eyes continued to fascinate me they had a peculiar disquieting effect now they died down and it was as if the man's very presence had gone out as though i had been left alone and i found it exceedingly difficult under the circumstances to continue to address him suddenly he flared up again watling send you over here he demanded no as a matter of fact he's out of town some of mr watling's friends mr grunewald and mr dickinson mr gorse and others suggested that i see you mr jason there came a grunt from the bed mr watling has always valued your friendship and support i said what makes him think he ain't going to get it 
he hasn't a doubt of it i went on diplomatically but we felt and i felt personally that we ought to be in touch with you to work along with you to keep informed how things are going in the city what things well there are one or two representatives friends of yours who haven't come out for mr watling we aren't worrying we know you'll do the right thing but we feel that it would have a good deal of influence in some other parts of the state if they declared themselves and then you know as well as i do that this isn't a year when any of us can afford to recognize too closely party lines the democratic administration has brought on a panic the business men in that party are down on it and it ought to be rebuked and we feel too that some of the city's democrats ought to be loyal to mr watling not that we expect them to vote for him in caucus but when it comes to the joint ballot who demanded mr jason senator douse and jim marr for instance i suggested jim voted for bill seven o nine all right didn't he said mr jason abruptly that's just it i put in boldly we'd like to induce him to come in with us this time but we feel that the inducement would better come through you i thought mr jason smiled by this time i had grown accustomed to the darkness the face and figure of the man in the bed had become discernible power i remember thinking chooses odd houses for itself here was no overbearing full-blooded ward ruffian brimming with vitality but a thin sallow little man in a cotton nightshirt with iron-gray hair and a wiry moustache he might have been an overworked clerk behind a dry goods counter and yet somehow now that i had talked to him i realized that he never could have been those extraordinary eyes of his when they were functioning marked his individuality as unique it were almost too dramatic to say that he required darkness to make his effect but so it seemed i should never forget him he had in truth been well named the spider of course we haven't tried to get in touch with them we are leaving them to you i added parrot he said suddenly i don't care a damn about grunewald never did i'd turn him down for ten cents but you can tell theodore watling for me and dickinson that i guess the inducement can be fixed i felt a certain relief that the interview had come to an end that the moment had arrived for amenities to my surprise mr jason anticipated me i have been interested in you mr parrot he observed know who you are of course knew you were in watling's office then some of the boys spoke about you when you were down at the legislature on that ribblevale matter guess you had more to do with that bill than came out in the newspapers eh i was taken off my guard oh that's talk i said all right it's talk then but i guess you and i will have some more talk after a while after theodore watling gets to be united states senator give him my regards and and come in when i can do anything for you mr parrot thanking him i groped my way downstairs and let myself out by a side door monahan had shown me into an alleyway thus avoiding the saloon as i walked slowly back to the office seeking the shade of the awnings the figure in the darkened room took on a sinister aspect that troubled me end of section thirteen section fourteen of a far country by winston churchill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain book two chapter twelve part two the autumn arrived the campaign was on with a whoop and i had my first taste of stump politics the acrid smell of red fire brings it back to me it was a medley of railroad travel of committees provided with badges and cigars of open carriages slowly drawn between lines of bewildered citizens of lincoln clubs and other clubs marching in serried ranks uniformed and helmeted stalwarts carrying torches and banners and then there were the draughty opera houses with the sylvan scenery pushed back 
and plush chairs and sofas pushed forward with an ominous table a pitcher of water on it and a glass near the footlights the houses were packed with more bewildered citizens what a wonderful study of mob psychology it would have offered men who had not thought of the grand old republican party for two years and who had not cared much about it when they had entered the dooms after an hour or so went mad with fervour the hon joseph mecklin ex-speaker of the house with whom i travelled on occasions had a speech referring to the martyred president ending with an appeal to the revolutionary fathers who followed washington with bleeding feet the hon joseph possessed the most valuable of political gifts presence and when with quivering voice he finished his peroration citizens wept with him what it all had to do with the tariff was not quite clear yet nobody seemed to miss the connection we were all of us most concerned of course about the working man and his dinner pail whom the democrats had wantonly thrown out of employment for the sake of a doctrinaire theory they had put him in competition with the serf of europe such was the subject matter of my own modest addresses in this my maiden campaign i had the sense to see myself in perspective to recognize that not for me a dignified and substantial lawyer of affairs were the rhetorical flights of the hon joseph mecklin i spoke with a certain restraint not too dryly i hope but i sought to curb my sentiments my indignation at the manner in which the working man had been treated to appeal to the common sense rather than to the passions of my audiences here were the statistics drawn by the way from the republican campaign book unscrupulous demagogues democratic of course had sought to twist and evade them let this terrible record of lack of employment and misery be compared with the prosperity under republican rule one of the most effective speakers in this campaign for the restoration of prosperity said the rossiter banner is mr hugh parrott of the firm of watling founds and ripon mr parrott's speech at the opera house last evening made a most favourable impression mr parrott deals with facts and his thoughtful analysis of the situation into which the democratic party has brought this country should convince any sane-minded voter that the time has come for a change i began to keep a scrap-book though i locked it up in the drawer of my desk in it are to be found many clippings in a similarly gratifying tenor mecklin and i were well contrasted in this way incidentally i made many valuable acquaintances among the solid men of the state the local capitalists and manufacturers with whom my manner of dealing with public questions was in particular favour these were practical men they rather patronized the hon joseph thus estimating to a nicety a man's value or solidity or specific gravity it might better be said since our universe was one of checks and balances the hon joseph and his like skyrocketing through the air were somehow necessary in the scheme of things but not to be taken too seriously me they did take seriously these provincial lords inviting me to their houses and opening their hearts thus when we came to elkington mr mecklin reposed in the commercial house on the noisy main street fortunately for him the clanging of trolley cars never interfered with his slumbers i slept in a wide chamber in the mansion of mr ezra hutchins there were many hutchinses in elkington brothers and cousins and uncles and great-uncles and all were connected with the woolen mills but there is always one supreme hutchins and ezra was he tall self-contained elderly but well preserved through frugal living essentially american and typical of his class when he entered the lobby of the commercial house that afternoon the babble of political discussion was suddenly hushed politicians travelling salesmen and the members of the local committee made a lane for him to him the hon joseph and i were introduced 
mr hutchins knew what we wanted he was cordial to mr mecklin but he took me we entered a most respectable surrey with tassels driven by a raw-boned coachman in a black overcoat drawn by two sleek horses how is this thing going parrot he asked i gave him mr grunewald's estimated majority what do you think he demanded a shrewd humorous look in his blue eyes well i think we'll carry the state i haven't had grunewald's experience in estimating ezra hutchins smiled appreciatively what does watling think he doesn't seem to be worrying much ever been in elkington before i said i hadn't well a drive will do you good it was about four o'clock on a mild october afternoon the little town of fifteen thousand inhabitants or so had a wonderful setting in the widening valley of the scopenong whose swiftly running waters furnished the power for the mills we drove to these through a gateway over which the words no admittance were conspicuously painted past long brick buildings that bordered the canals and in the windows i caught sight of drab figures of men and women bending over the machines half of the buildings as mr hutchins pointed out were closed mute witnesses of tariff tinkering madness even more eloquent of democratic folly was that part of the town through which we presently passed streets lined with rows of dreary houses where the workers lived children were playing on the sidewalks but there seemed a listless play listless too were the men and women who sat on the steps listless and somewhat sullen as they watched us passing ezra hutchins seemed to read my thought since the unions got in here i've had nothing but trouble he said i've tried to do my duty by my people god knows but they won't see which side their bread's buttered on they oppose me at every step they vote against their own interests some years ago they put up a job on us and sent a scatter-brained radical to the legislature krebs do you know him slightly he was in my class at harvard is he still here i asked after a pause oh yes but he hasn't gone to the legislature this time we've seen to that his father was a respectable old german who had a little shop and made eyeglasses the son is an example of too much education he's a notoriety seeker oh he's clever in a way he's given us a good deal of trouble too in the courts with damage cases we came to a brighter more spacious well-to-do portion of the town where the residences faced the river in a little while the waters widened into a lake which was surrounded by a park a gift to the city of the hutchins family facing it on one side was the hutchins library on the other across a wide street where the maples were turning were the hutchinsons residences of various dates of construction from that of the younger george who had lately married a wife and built in bright yellow brick to the old-fashioned mansion of ezra himself this he told me had been good enough for his father and was good enough for him the picture of it comes back to me now with singular attractiveness it was of brick and i suppose a modification of the georgian the kind of house one still sees in the out-of-way corners of london with a sort of dickensy flavour high and square and uncompromising with small paned windows with a flat roof surrounded by a low balustrade and many substantial chimneys the third story was lower than the others separated from them by a distinct line on one side was a wide porch yellow and red leaves the day's fall scattered the well-kept lawn standing in the doorway of the house was a girl in white and as we descended from the surrey she came down the walk to meet us she was young about twenty her hair was the colour of the russet maple leaves this is mr parrot maud mr hutchins looked at his watch as does a man accustomed to live by it if you'll excuse me mr parrot i have something important to attend to perhaps mr parrot would like to look about the grounds he addressed his daughter i said i should be delighted though i had no idea what grounds were meant 
as i followed maude around the house she explained that all the hutchins connection had a common backyard as she expressed it in reality there were about two blocks of the property extending behind all the houses there were great trees with swings groves orchards where the late apples glistened between the leaves an old-fashioned flower garden loath to relinquish its blooming in the distance the shadowed western ridge hung like a curtain of deep blue velvet against the sunset what a wonderful spot i exclaimed yes it is nice she agreed we were all brought up here i mean my cousins and myself there are dozens of us and dozens left she added as the shouts and laughter of children broke the stillness a boy came running around the corner of the path he struck out at maude with a remarkably swift movement she retaliated ouch he exclaimed you got him that time i laughed and being detected she suddenly blushed it was this act that drew my attention to her that defined her as an individual before that i had regarded her merely as a shy and provincial girl now she was brimming with an unsuspected vitality a certain interest was aroused although her shyness towards me was not altered i found it rather a flattering shyness it's hugh she explained he's always trying to be funny speak to mr parrot hugh why that's my name too i said is it she knocked my hat off a little while ago said hugh i was only getting square well you didn't get square did you i asked are you going to speak in the town hall tonight the boy demanded i admitted it he went off pausing once to stare back at me maude and i walked on it must be exciting to speak before a large audience she said if i were a man i think i should like to be in politics i cannot imagine you in politics i answered she laughed i said if i were a man are you going to the meeting oh yes father promised to take me he has a box i thought it would be pleasant to have her there i'm afraid you'll find what i have to say rather dry i said a woman can't expect to understand everything she answered quickly this remark struck me favourably i glanced at her sideways she was not a beauty but she was distinctly well formed and strong her face was oval her features not quite regular giving them a certain charm her colour was fresh her eyes blue the lighter blue one sees on chinese ware not a poetic comparison but so i thought of them she was apparently not sophisticated as were most of the young women at home whom i knew intimately as were the watling twins for example with one of whom francis i had had by the way rather a lively flirtation the spring before she seemed refreshingly original impressionable and plastic we walked slowly back to the house and in the hallway i met mrs hutchins a bustling housewifely lady inclined to stoutness whose creased and kindly face bore witness to long acquiescence in the discipline of matrimony to the contentment that results from an essentially circumscribed and comfortable life she was i learned later the second mrs hutchins and maude their only child the children of the first marriage all girls had married and scattered supper was a decorous but heterogeneous meal of the old-fashioned sort that gives one the choice between tea and cocoa it was something of an occasion i suspected the minister was there the reverend mr doddridge who would have made in appearance at least a perfect puritan divine in a steeple hat and a tippet only he was no longer the leader of the community and even in his grace he had the air of deferring to the man who provided the bounties of which we were about to partake rather than to the almighty young george was there mr hutchins nephew who was daily becoming more and more of a factor in the management of the mills and had built the house of yellow brick 
that stood out so incongruously among the older hutchins's mansions and marked a transition i thought him rather a yellow brick gentleman himself for his assumption of cosmopolitan manners his wife was a pretty discontented little woman who plainly deplored her environment longed for larger fields of conquest george she said must remain where he was for the present at least uncle ezra depended on him but elkington was a prosy place and mrs george gave the impression that she did not belong here they went to the city on occasions both cities and when she told me we had a common acquaintance in mrs hambleton durrett whom she thought so lovely i knew that she had taken nancy as an ideal nancy the social leader of what was to mrs george a metropolis presently the talk became general among the men the subject being the campaign and i the authority bombarded with questions i strove to answer judiciously what was the situation in this county and in that the national situation george indulged in rather a vigorous arraignment of the demagogues national and state who were hurting business in order to obtain political power the reverend mr doddridge assented deploring the poverty that the local people had brought on themselves by heeding the advice of agitators and mrs hutchins who spent much of her time in charity work agreed with the minister when he declared that the trouble was largely due to a decline in christian belief ezra hutchins too nodded at this take that man krebs for example the minister went on stimulated by this encouragement he's an atheist pure and simple a sympathetic shudder went around the table at the word george alone smiled old krebs was a free thinker i used to get my glasses of him he was at least a conscientious man a good workman which is more than can be said for the son young krebs has talent and if only he had devoted himself to the honest practice of law instead of stirring up dissatisfaction among these people he would be a successful man to-day mr hutchins explained that i was at college with krebs these people must like him i said or they wouldn't have sent him to the legislature well a good many of them do like him the minister admitted you see he actually lives among them they believe his socialistic doctrines because he's a friend of theirs he won't represent this town again that's sure exclaimed george you didn't see in the papers that he was nominated did you parrot but if the mill people wanted him george how could it be prevented his wife demanded george winked at me there are more ways of skinning a cat than one he said cryptically well it's time to go to the meeting i guess remarked ezra rising once more he looked at his watch we were packed into several family carriages and started off in front of the hall the inevitable red fire was burning its quivering light reflected on the faces of the crowd that blocked the street they stood silent strangely apathetic as we pushed through them to the curb and the red fire went out suddenly as we descended my temporary sense of depression however deserted me as we entered the hall which was well lighted and filled with people who clapped when the honourable joseph and i accompanied by mr doddridge and the honourable henry clay mellish from pottstown with the local chairman walked out on the stage a glance over the audience sufficed to ascertain that that portion of the population whose dinner pails we longed to fill was evidently not present in large numbers but the farmers had driven in from the hills while the merchants and storekeepers of elkington had turned out loyally the chairman in introducing me proclaimed me as a coming man and declared that i had already achieved in the campaign considerable notoriety as i spoke i was pleasantly aware of maude hutchins leaning forward a little across the rail of the right-hand stage-box for the town hall was half opera house 
her attitude was one of semi-absorbed admiration and the thought that i had made an impression on her stimulated me i spoke with more aplomb somewhat to my surprise i found myself making occasional unexpected witticisms that drew laughter and applause suddenly from the back of the hall a voice called out how about house bill 709 there was a silence then a stirring and craning of necks it was my first experience of heckling and for the moment i was taken aback i thought of krebs he had indeed been in my mind since i had risen to my feet and i had scanned the faces before me in search of his but it was not his voice well what about bill seven o nine i demanded you ought to know something about it i guess the voice responded put him out came from the various portions of the hall inwardly i was shaken not in orthodox language from any conviction of sin yet it was my first intimation that my part in the legislation referred to was known to any save a select few i blamed krebs and a hot anger arose within me against him after all what could they prove no don't put him out i said let him come up here to the platform i'll yield to him and i'm entirely willing to discuss with him and defend any measures passed in the legislature of this state by a republican majority perhaps i added the gentleman has a copy of the law in his pocket that i may know what he is talking about and answer him intelligently at this there was wild applause i had the audience with me the offender remained silent and presently i finished my speech after that mr mecklin made them cheer and weep and mr mellish made them laugh the meeting had been highly successful you polished him off all right said george hutchins as he took my hand who was he oh one of the local soreheads krebs put him up to it of course was krebs here i asked sitting in the corner of the balcony that meeting must have made him feel sick george bent forward and whispered in my ear i thought bill seven o nine was watling's idea oh i happened to be in the potts house about that time i explained george of whom it may be gathered that he was not wholly unsophisticated grinned at me appreciatively say parrot he replied putting his hand through my arm there's a little legal business in prospect down here that will require some handling and i wish you'd come down after the campaign and talk it over with us i've just about made up my mind that you're the man to tackle it all right i'll come i said and stay with me said george we went to his yellow brick house for refreshments salad and ice cream and in the face of the hutchins traditions champagne others had been invited in some twenty persons once in a while when i looked up i met maud's eyes across the room i walked home with her slowly the length of the hutchins's block floating over the lake was a waning october moon that cast through the thinning maples a lacework of shadows at our feet i had the feeling of well-being that comes to heroes and the presence of maud hutchins was an incense a vestal incense far from unpleasing yet she had reservations which appealed to me hers was not a gushing provincialism like that of mrs george i liked your speech so much mr parrot she told me it seemed so sensible and controlled compared to the others i have never thought a great deal about these things of course and i never understood before why taking away the tariff caused so much misery you made that quite plain if so i'm glad i said she was silent a moment the working people here have had a hard time during the last year she went on some of the mills had to be shut down you know it has troubled me indeed it has troubled all of us and what has made it more difficult more painful is that many of them seem actually to dislike us 
that he think it's father's fault and that he can run all the mills if he wanted to i've been around a little with mother and sometimes the women wouldn't accept any help from us they said they'd rather starve than take charity that they had the right to work but father couldn't run the mills at a loss could he certainly not i replied and then there's mr krebs of whom we were speaking at supper and who puts all kinds of queer notions into their heads father says he's an anarchist i heard father say at supper that he was at harvard with you did you like him well i answered hesitatingly i didn't know him very well of course not she put in i suppose you couldn't have he's got these notions i explained that are mischievous and crazy but i don't dislike him i'm glad to hear you say that she answered quietly i like him too he seems so kind so understanding do you know him well she hesitated i feel as though i do i've only met him once and that was by accident it was the day the big strike began last spring and i'd been shopping and started for the mills to get father to walk home with me as i used to do i saw the crowds blocking the streets around the canal at first i paid no attention to them but after a while i began to be a little uneasy there were places where i had to squeeze through and i couldn't help seeing that something was wrong and that the people were angry men and women were talking in loud voices one woman stared at me and called my name and said something that frightened me terribly i went into a doorway and then i saw mr krebs i didn't know who he was he just said you'd better come with me miss hutchins and i went with him i thought afterwards that it was a very courageous thing for him to do because he was so popular with the mill people and they had such a feeling against us yet they didn't seem to resent it and made way for us and mr krebs spoke to many of them as we passed after we got to state street i asked him his name and when he told me i was speechless he took off his hat and went away he had such a nice face not at all ugly when you look at it twice and kind eyes that i just couldn't believe him to be as bad as father and george think he is of course he is mistaken she added hastily but i am sure he is sincere and honestly thinks he can help those people by telling them what he does the question shot at me during the meeting rankled still i wanted to believe that krebs had inspired it and her championship of him gave me a twinge of jealousy the slightest twinge to be sure yet a perceptible one at the same time the unaccountable liking i had for the man stirred to life the act she described had been so characteristic he's one of the born rebels against society i said glibly yet i do think he's sincere maude was grave i should be sorry to think he wasn't she replied after i had bidden her good-night at the foot of the stairs and gone to my room i reflected how absurd it was to be jealous of krebs what was maude hutchins to me and even if she had been something to me she never could be anything to krebs all the forces of our civilization stood between the two nor was she of a nature to take plunges of that sort the next day as i lay back in my seat in the parlor car and gazed at the autumn landscape i indulged in a luxurious contemplation of the picture she had made as she stood on the lawn under the trees in the early morning light when my carriage had driven away and i had turned to perceive that her eyes had followed me i was not in love with her of course i did not wish to return at once to elkington but i dwelt with a pleasant anticipation upon my visit when the campaign should be over with george end of section fourteen